Matt Zernzak, and I'm a bow hunter. I got into archery kind of by accident. A lot of my friends and buddies were extending their season shooting archery uh, at our local club, and they would also archery hunt during the off season from rifle season. And I didn't have a big interest in archery hunting uh, for white-tailed deer, but I was very jealous that every Tuesday night all my friends were getting together and they were shooting at our local club. Uh, they were all shooting compounds uh, with fingers. And I had mentioned in February one year uh, to my fiance at the time that I had an interest in recurves. I thought recurves were cool. And fast forward 10 months and for Christmas, Christmas morning I wake up and my fiance bought me a, my very first recurve. Um, completely surprised me and I got into the world of traditional archery pretty much by accident. There's a lot of people out there that are either frustrated with their accuracy with a recurve or a longbow, or there's a lot of people, a lot of compound archers, or people that don't even participate in archery currently that are interested in traditional archery, but they don't know where to start. We as a traditional community are extremely proud of the equipment that we choose. We choose to limit ourselves in our range in the woods while we're hunting. We choose to limit ourselves to equipment that the archery industry was founded on. There's a lot of compound archers that are on the outside looking in and they're very interested in trying traditional archery. But they go to these local shoots or they look on the internet and it's this mystery. You know, throw a baseball, stare at the spot, focus, and your arrow's supposed to go there. But there is an easier way. And I wanted to put out a video that showed the basics. Um, you have to go to 10, 15 different sites, different videos, just to gather everything you need to know to start shooting your first arrow. Compound archers are they want to try it. They're bow hunters, they're sportsmen, just like, just like any other person carrying a recurve or a longbow into the woods. But they're nervous. They're nervous that they're gonna lose accuracy. They're nervous that they're going to lose their reputation as being a sure thing killer in the woods. If you have a routine shot sequence and a concrete aiming system, you can shoot a recurve or a longbow very accurately. And so this video is for you. You guys that are out there that have always carried a compound bow into the woods or a crossbow, but always wanted to try a recurve or a longbow. This video is for you, those guys that have been struggling for three to five years shooting a recurve and a longbow instinctively, but you're frustrated with your accuracy. This video is also for you guys that have and own a longbow and recurve. And every spring, you tell yourself, this is the year I'm going to carry a recurve or a longbow into the woods. But come August, you're not satisfied with your accuracy and you fall back onto the compound and the cycle continues. Well, this is the year that you're going to carry your recurve into the woods. There are a hundred different ways to shoot a bow and this is just one of them. A full aiming system that will help you shoot your recurve and longbow accurately. If you are completely satisfied with your shooting abilities with a recurve and longbow, then this video is not for you. But if you want to be able to accurately shoot your bow within a short period of time, then this video is for you, and enjoy. When you're looking into recurves and longbows and the different types of recurves and longbows that are out there, you'll find that the bows themselves are as personal and individual as the person that's actually shooting that bow. So I wanted to just demonstrate for you guys all the different types of bows that are out there. There's something very primal about carrying a recurve into the woods. I remember my very first day hunting with a recurve couldn't stop staring at the bow. You kind of squeeze that bow real tight and you just, you feel complete. You feel like this is the weapon that you need to be carrying into the woods. Um, so what I'm going to do is I have every type of bow up here behind me and I want to step through each type of bow. Before I go through some of the specific types of bows, I just want to show a couple really high level things about a recurve or a longbow, some characteristics and how they differ from a compound. First, part is that there is no cam rolling over. There's no hard draw stop. So with a recurve, you can draw it to 26 inches long with a draw length, and the same bow can be shot at 30 inches. And for every inch that you go past its rating or shorter than its rating of the draw length, 
Typically, on a modern recurve or longbow, it's about two to two and a half pounds per inch. And industry standard for rating one of these bows is at 28 inches. So the draw length as you draw back to 28 inches, this bow is marked 60 pounds at 28 inches. And if I were to have a 29 inch draw length, that would be a 62, 62 and a half pound bow. Conversely to that, if I only had a 27 inch draw length, it would be about 58 pounds, 57 and a half. Some characteristics of a recurve, I'm gonna start with a recurve. So with a recurve, if the string, it's defined as if the string actually touches the belly of the bow, and the belly of the bow is this side of the limb, the backing of the bow is this side of the limb. And so, obviously the recurve has this recurve tip to it. That's what makes it a recurve. And if the string touches anywhere on this belly side of the bow, then it's classified as a recurve. Um, for a standard traditional bow, you have your string, string silencers. Where you hold the bow is the riser area. This is the shelf. This is the side plate. Okay, then you have your limbs and your limb tips. And your brace height is measured. The brace height is the distance from the string to the deepest part of the throat. And you can measure that with a tape measure. And every bow, when you buy a new bow, the boyer, which is a person that makes bows, uh, will have a recommended brace height for that given bow, a range, seven and a half to eight and a half inches. Um, that's one of the things you need to check um, periodically as you're shooting, is just make sure that your string hasn't stretched and that you can adjust your brace height properly and get it into the right range. Another differentiating characteristic of a recurve compared to more modern equipment like a compound is arrow speeds you can expect. With a standard hunting weight arrow, a recurve or a longbow with modern materials ranges anywhere from 140 feet per second up to 210. When you start cresting over the 200 feet per second mark, that's getting pretty quick for a longbow or a recurve. Typical bow lengths that you'll see out there when you're shopping around for bows can range anywhere from 54 inches all the way up to 68 inches, 70 inches in two inch increments. Um, most commonly that you'll see for hunting bows is 58 inches, 60 inches, 62 and 64. Those four sizes seem to be the most common where 80% of those bows out there fall into that category. There are exceptions to that rule, but for the most part, from a hunting standpoint, 58, 60, 62 and 64 are the most common um, in all those bows. 80% of the bows fall into that category. Another characteristic of a recurve and a long bow is called tiller, and that's something that you should be aware of. Tiller is the measurement from the top of the riser to the string, perpendicular to the string. This measurement compared to this measurement. Okay, um, even tiller is basically, this measurement is the same. And that basically says that these limbs are preloaded the same. And even tiller is typical for a person that is shooting three under, and we'll go over that more in detail later, versus split finger where you would have the bottom limb a little bit stronger than the top limb. So this dimension will be smaller than the top limb, meaning that this limb is pulling against that string harder than the top limb. And so it's pulling that string closer to the limb. So that's how you know which limb is stronger on your bow for tiller, is the distance of the string to the top of the riser and the bottom of the riser. Another thing to be aware of with a traditional bow is your knock height. So grabbing an arrow to knock an arrow onto this string, the knock height is the distance that the knock end snaps onto the string above the shelf. We'll go over this more in detail during the arrow tuning section, um, but knock height is something you need to be aware of. One common pitfall for a new archer picking up a recurve or a longbow is they'll get overbowed. They'll get overbowed very quickly by buying a bow that they can't handle. Um, you start, loot, you start developing poor form, um, poor technique, and bad habits. So it's generally suggested to start off with a lighter weight bow and get the basics of shooting a recurve and a long bow down, and then incrementally step your uh, draw weight up. For a new compound archer coming to traditional archery, there's a lot of suggestions out on the web that say to buy a 35 pound bow and start there, start with a 30 pound bow and get it down. Um, most of these guys are pulling a 70 pound compound and I realize that there's an 80% let off and they're not holding a whole lot of weight. But for the standard 20 to 30 to maybe even 40 year old archer, 
you can handle a 40 to 45 pound bow very comfortably. And I think that's a good place to start. As mentioned before, there are a lot of different bows out there and a lot of different types of bow. And this is a personal preference. When you go to a bow shoot and there's a lot of traditional archers there, you'll see that their bows and their equipment are completely personalized and they're completely different from one another's. So I'd like to give you a crash course, a very high level review of all the different types of bows, um, starting over here to my right, your left. Um, we basically go from primitive to very modern in order. So I'd like to show you a few of these bows. The first category of bow is called a self bow. And the self bow is basically a long bow that is carved out of a single piece of wood. Osage is a very common self bow material. And this is an Osage self bow. You can see how snaky it is. Um, very lightweight in the hand and very beautiful. Self bows are typically very quiet, but they're not that fast. Self bows are the most primitive bows in the traditional archery category. Typically paired with a self bow is a cedar arrow, and we'll go over arrow types later on. Self bows, making self bows and shooting self bows is a labor of love. They're very beautiful, they're very unforgiving, and guys will spend 50 hours carving out a self bow just to have a break on them when they shoot their first arrow. So behind me, you'll see a couple different self bows. This is a self bow with no backing. Backing is a material applied to the backing of the bow, this face of the bow, to help it retain its shape and also be stronger. So this bow does not have any backing. This is just a pure Osage self bow. The next one you'll see is backed with bamboo. Very pretty. A archer at our club, one of the best hunters that I know, makes, has made all of these bows, these self bows here. This one is backed with bamboo. Very beautiful, very lightweight. The next type of bow here is another self bow. And you can see that it is backed with snake skins. Another very pretty bow. And again, self bows are typically on the slower end of the range but are very quiet. They tend to be a little unforgiving and arrow tune is very important with a self bow to get the maximum efficiency downrange when hunting with a self bow. And, and again, we'll talk more about arrow tuning later. The next type of bow I'd like to show you is getting into laminated bows. All modern bows, recurves and long bows are typically, most you'll find out there are laminated. Uh, it's a myriad of materials laminated together, very strong, and typically the performance is much better. This is a reflex deflex longbow. Longbows can pretty much be categorized into two categories, reflex deflex and then standard D shape. And what I mean by reflex deflex, this curvature here is the deflex and you can see that the limb starts reflexing back, almost like a recurve. But a longbow, string this up real quick, but a longbow is defined as, conversely to the recurve, that the string does not touch the belly of the bow. And this is a longbow. But you can see, even in its strung state, you have the deflex and the limb starts curving as a reflex. So this is a modern reflex deflex. And typically, the reflex in the limb geometry will make it a little bit faster than your standard D style bows. Maybe a little louder, but in the grand scheme of things, a long bow is definitely on the quieter end of the traditional bow category. While filming the bow section, we had a mishap with the camera and the data. So we lost midway through, I think it was the fifth or sixth bow type I was going to review, which is the standard D-shaped long bow. A D-shaped long bow can come in any grip configuration, uh, whether it be a flat grip, or more of a pistol style grip as seen on this Fox Triple Crown Longbow. But a standard D shape as compared to a reflex deflex longbow is that when strung, the deflex curve of this limb continues on down towards the tip. Most competition organizations require a continuous D shape with no reflex in the limb when it was strung, when the bow is strung. So I wanted to just review over this bow, this different type of bow, and again, it is a long bow, 
Um, the string does not touch the belly of the bow. And uh, it's a very nice bow, very nice competition bow, and it's a great option. Okay, moving on to recurves. Recurves come in two categories, takedown, or a three-piece, and a one-piece. Here's an example of a one-piece, this is a Bear Kodiak. One-piece recurves are typically lighter in the hand, so it's nice if you're packing in three to four miles to hunt, it's nice to have a lightweight bow. Um, one-piece recurves tend to have a little bit more traditional feel to the bow. Um, you can see that the limbs fade in right here at the riser fade out and are laminated to the riser. I like one-piece recurves, they're very nice, but I do prefer a three-piece, and I'll talk about some of the benefits of a three-piece, but um, a lot of guys prefer a one-piece recurve, and they're very nice, and um, try them out. Moving on down the line, the rest of these bows are all takedown bows, so you can see I do prefer takedown bows. A couple different limb attachment methods is with a bolt, and some have a double bolt system, one has a single bolt with a hidden pin in them, but a, a three-piece recurve is very nice. They're typically a little bit more mass weight, uh, which makes it a little bit more stable to shoot. It, the bow's not jumping around on you upon release. Um, it's really nice to be able to take down the bow. If you're a hunter that travels, it's really nice to take the limbs off, throw them in your suitcase or in the back of your car, and go on your trip, and it's just very nice for travel. An additional benefit of a three-piece recurve is multiple sets of limbs. Some guys will, all through the off-season, they'll be shooting their 30, 35, 40 pound limbs for target archery or form training. But then as soon as hunting season comes around, they pull out their hunting limbs, they slap it on the riser that they've been shooting all summer long, and there you go, you're ready to go. You have a nice hunting weight bow. So basically you're, the benefit is you get to shoot the same riser all year round and you can change the limbs out and adjust your weight up or down. Moving on down the line, we have a bunch of different, different types of takedowns. Um, one other takedown I want to note is this Black Widow PSA here. Now, this is a 58 inch bow, but you'll notice that the limbs are attached to the rear of the riser. And this reverse mount limb is Black Widow's one of the companies that does this, as well as Hill Country bows. And there's a couple other manufacturers that are mounting their limbs to the back side of the bow. So, so just something to be aware of. It is a difference. Most of the bows out there have their limbs attached to the front, like this Bob Lee Ultimate here but this Black Widow does have its limbs attached to the back side of the riser. And another thing I want to note, because this is a very good example, is there are laminated accent stripes in this Black Widow riser. These are phenolic stripes that add strength and beauty to these risers. So you'll see that this is an Alma Carter riser, as well as this Bob Lee Ultimate, and this is wood with phenolic, and then there's also this Predator here that is mostly all wood, takedown riser. Um, it's all a preference. Uh, the Micarta, all black risers tend to be a little bit heavier. Black Widows with all this phenolic are also heavier, very stable bows, but it's all a preference thing. You just got to shoot them and try them out. So I'd like to move on from the wooden takedown recurves to the more modern recurves. Here is a Hoyt Buffalo. A Hoyt Buffalo is a very modern machined aluminum riser. It has Hoyt's proprietary formula limb attachment system, and I'll describe the ILF and formula attachment systems a little bit more in detail later on. But these modern risers and modern limb sets with a machined aluminum riser basically lend themselves to maximizing your tuning for hunting and your arrow setup. Um, I really like the aluminum risers. I'm a big fan of them. I've been hunting with aluminum risers for two years now, and I compete with an aluminum riser. Um, I highly recommend trying them. And guys coming over from compound archery tend to fall into two categories. They're either looking to get as far away from compound archery and they go into the wooden recurves and they really want to dive into the traditional spirit. And other guys want something that has a real similar feel and look to their compound equipment. So a Hoyt Buffalo is a very good option for one of those compound archers that are coming over looking for a little bit more modern style recurve or longbow. The next type of bows here that I have are ILF risers. These ILF is International Limb Fit and these limbs snap into these risers. This is a WF-19. This is my hunting riser currently and you'll see that I do have a stabilizer and I'll talk about my hunting setup and my preferences later on. But basically, again, another machined aluminum riser. These WF-19 and these WF-25 competition risers are very, very nice. Now, you'll notice that 
I'm still shooting off the shelf here with this competition, or I'm sorry, this is their hunting version, 19 inch, but I'm still shooting off the shelf with an adjustable side plate. There's no spring in here, but I can micro tune my setup and I'll go over that more later on. But again, if you wanna have a modern feel to the recurve or longbow, try an ILF riser and there's multiple manufacturers out there making machined aluminum and even wooden ILF risers. And I'll show you the ILF attachment system here in a couple minutes. And then all the way at the other end of the spectrum from a self bow is a competition riser. Competition risers are typically, competition bows are typically 25 inch long risers um, with threaded inserts for attachment systems like a stabilizer. They also have elevated magnetic rests and adjustable plungers. So you can actually micro tune your setup for maximum accuracy or depending on the distance you're shooting, you can make your arrow impact left and right by this adjustable plunger here that has a spring in there and you, you adjust your spring tension here. So I do compete with this during the off season from hunting and again, a far cry from a self bow. I am currently infatuated with the ILF and formula limb attachment systems. So I wanted to go into a little detail because I think for a new traditional archer, it's a great option. So, these three bows are either ILF or formula. The Hoyt Buffalo is Hoyt's proprietary formula limb system. And these WF made by C&D Archery, these WF risers, the WF-19 and the WF-25 are ILF, which is International Limb Fit. And I wanna show you the benefit of the ILF. So with a standard bolt down, you do have the benefit of having multiple limbs for that bow, but you have to buy them from that manufacturer because they are custom fit to that riser that that manufacturer makes. The nice thing about ILF is that there are a myriad of manufacturers making ILF standard geometry limbs and ILF risers. ILF risers can come in wood, really pretty laminated wood like the Black Widows and the Bob Lees and the Predators, but also, they make them in aluminum, and it's a little bit heavier mass weight for a real stable shooting bow. I wanted to show you here the ILF attachment system, and it's simple as that. A bolt down, you take your Allen wrench, you're always losing your Allen wrenches, and you're unscrewing the bolts, and you take the limbs off. With an ILF attachment system, it's basically a detent dovetail that slides into the detent dovetail channel and a U-channel cut out of the bait butt end of the limb that attaches to your tiller bolt. And I wanna show you a couple of the benefits of this and how easy this is. It's literally a two finger operation. And you're in, and you string it up. And you'll see that there is a little bit of limb slop here, but as long as that dovetail's firmly seated into the dovetail groove, this limb won't go anywhere. And then when you string it, the tension of the string holds that limb very solid. Another benefit of the ILF limb attachment system is that you can adjust weight and tiller. So by weight, I mean these tiller bolts, there's a set screw in the back of the riser. And you unscrew that set screw, which frees up this tiller bolt to either be screwed in or out. If you screw this tiller bolt in, you're changing the preload of your limb, which will make your poundage go up, which is really nice for not only tuning, but also just getting comfortable weight. If you haven't shot for a while and you have a 50 pound bow, crank those limb bolts or those tiller bolts out and now your, your, your bow is nice smooth feeling for you. But again, the ILF limb attachment system is as easy as that. The major benefit of the ILF limb attachment system is that there are so many manufacturers making ILF limbs and ILF risers. Whether they're aluminum risers or they're wooden risers that have the ILF geometry and limb attachment system, but also the limbs from multiple manufacturers. So for an example, I can have these longbow limbs made by Tradtech Archery, and I can swap them instantly with these recurve limbs from Tradtech Archery as well for my hunting rig whenever fall comes. And then if I want to shoot indoor archery with this riser, I can grab a set of very inexpensive, super lightweight, 38 pound competition limbs and snap those in. The options are endless. My competition bow is a very good example of that. It is a US made WF25 riser from C&D Archery, mated up with Scottish made limbs from Border Archery. 
And so basically, there are thousands upon thousands of combinations that you can have, and it's really inexpensive to get into it. You can invest in a very good riser, and all of these limbs that I just attached to these riser, the limb sets are $120 or below. So I hope that very high level review of all the different types of traditional bows was very helpful to you. Again, very personalized preferences from archer to archer on what bows they wanna shoot and why. Um, again, from a high level review, we have our self bows, all carved out of a single piece of wood. We have our backed self bows that have a laminated backing mm -hmm. for strength. We have our reflex deflex long bows. And again, a long bow with the string that does not touch the belly of the bow. We have our standard D-shape longbow. Again, D-shape longbows come in very traditional, like hill-style bows, and then also competition-grade longbows. We have our one-piece recurves. We have our takedown, bolt-down recurves. More takedown recurves. We have, like the Black Widows, the reverse limb attachment to the riser. All risers, most risers, are laminated with accent stripes of phenolic to make them a little bit stronger. We have our double bolt limb attachment systems as seen on the Bob Lees, our single bolt limb attachment systems as seen on the Predators, and then we get into our formula limb attachment systems and our ILF limb attachment systems for the more modern style traditional equipment. When shooting a traditional bow, you don't use a release typically. So you have to protect your string fingers. If you're a right-handed shooter, your right hand. If you're a left-handed shooter, your left hand. And there's a couple different options. Um, one of which being a glove. Now a glove is basically, um, it's finger stalls that your three shooting fingers, string hand fingers fall into. And basically the glove then straps around your wrist. There's a couple different styles of gloves. There's ones with, um, Leather, all leather, like, like what you see here. There's ones that have nylon stitched into them. There are half gloves like this where there's no glove material on the palm. There's full gloves that have the finger, the leather from the fingertips come down and strap to the strap. And then there's actually full gloves out there that guys use that they'll actually slide their whole hand into them. Um, some benefits of fingers, I, I call them fingers, but uh, a shooting glove. Um, some benefits of a shooting glove is once you have it, it's there. It's on you. It's it, it, your dexterity is there. It, it is nice. It, it is nice. I shot gloves for years, um, and they typically say that you can't get as smooth of a release with a glove than you can a tab. But you know, again, a very personal preference. Um, it seems to be 50/50 um, of traditional shooters. Half of them are using gloves. Half of them are using tabs. So, um, again, just another personal preference. You got to try both to, sit, to figure out if you're going to like them or not. The other type of finger protection are finger tabs. Um, I always wanted to shoot a finger tab for the longest time. I, again, I shot uh, a glove for years and years. Um, the reason why I really wanted to shoot a finger tab was on a lot of the archery videos or even Olympic archers. Every Olympic archer out there uses a shooting tab, so there's something to be said there. Uh, it's said that a finger tab, you get a smoother release, and I do believe that now that I've been shooting a tab for a couple years now. Um, tabs are basically split up into two uh, different types of cuts for the facing. Um, they have calf hair tabs where there's actual uh, fur on them for a smooth release. Um, but I use cordovan leather. A uh, cordovan leather tab is just, it's a forever tab. I think this tab here I've been shooting for about four years and it's still going strong. I mean, they just, they wear so well. And once you break a tab in, um, man, it, it, it just has such a good release. But the two different cut styles is a three under tab, if you're a three under shooter, and we'll talk a little bit more about that specifically, and then a split finger tab, which actually has a cut here. So when you go one finger over the knock and two below, that the knock can slide in between the cut in this tab. Another um, configuration here for the tabs that I uh, have found is, I call them 90 degree tabs or parallel tabs. And a 90 degree tab is when you hold your hand out it drops and falls 90 degrees from the surface of your hand. Whereas this tab here is a parallel tab to where when you hold your hand out, the hole in the tab is a nylon string or a different other type of loop 
and the tab stays flush against parallel to the surface. Um, as hard as I try, I cannot shoot a parallel tab for some reason. Um, I always have to shoot the 90 degree tab um, with the finger hole cut into the profile of the tab. This is a Fred Eichler tab. Um, you can buy these from Three Rivers. This is my favorite tab. I use this for competition and hunting. Um, this is an example of the parallel tab, which is a Rod Jenkins Safari Tough um, tab, 300 tab. Um, very nice, high quality tab. This is a very popular tab, came out a couple years ago. So um, again, it's all personal preference, whichever tab you like, whichever glove style you like. Um, if you like to shoot a glove, if you like to shoot a tab, you just gotta try them both and, and see, um, see what you like. I want to talk briefly about the different types of arrows to be used with traditional equipment with recurves and longbows. For any beginning archers that don't have any experience with arrows, um, just real briefly, you have the arrow tip, uh, you have the arrow shaft, the fletching with traditional equipment shooting off the shelf, you want to use feathers. Uh, these are turkey feathers that are uh, bleached and then dyed. Um, basically any feather that you buy out there um, are turkey feathers. Um, so these feathers come in very uh, different lengths, shapes, sizes, um, colors, and then at the very back end you have your arrow knock, the part that attaches the arrow to the string. A cedar arrow is really nice because when you put it in your back quiver um, or any type of uh, side quiver to where your arrow shafts are going to be um, banging against each other, cedar arrows are typically quieter than, and they don't have that tinny sound of a carbon or an aluminum arrow. Also they're heavy mass weight which is good for hunting um, uh, for traditional equipment. Some downsides to cedar arrows is they do take a little tender love and care as you're shooting them. Every now and then you'll want to look down the arrow and you might have to straighten it with your palm. You might find the bend in the arrow and you want to just bend it back in. Um, but they are a blast to shoot. They're a lot of fun and you know a self bow and cedar arrows are a match made in heaven. They just go together. Um, I've shot cedar arrows through modern recurves. Um, I've I've hunted with them briefly in the late season. I've never harvested an animal with a cedar arrow. It is on my bucket list. I do want to do that sometime. Um, but they are fun to build and they're fun to shoot. Um, you can buy some very high-end uh, wooden arrows. Paul Jalon from Elite Arrows is, is one of them. Makes some really, really nice um, target grade, competition grade cedar arrows. And you would think that they're a carbon arrow. They're so well manufactured. So um, yeah, give them a try. Nice thing about cedar arrows is they're fully customizable. Um, <clears throat> typically you'll see them with painted crestings on the back side where the feathers are. Um, you can, my cheap way of doing it is just some spray paint. You can make them look cool with some white on the front and white on the back. You can see the difference in these feather profiles. This is a five and a half inch shield cut feather and you can buy choppers and you can buy these turkey feathers in full length, 12 inch length feathers that already are ground down on the quill. And the quill is the section of the feather that actually gets glued to the arrow. And you can lay that full length turkey feather into a chopper and the chopper has these different profiles. So five and a half inch um, shield. This is a parabolic cut and there's all different types of cuts and styles um, that you can buy different traditional choppers. Um, here's another example of uh, a cedar arrow here that, that I built. Um, they're just a blast. So try a cedar arrow. I think you'll enjoy them. The next type of shaft material I'd like to review is an aluminum arrow. Aluminum shaft material is a great arrow choice. Um, I hunted with aluminum arrows for years. One of my closest hunting partners still hunts with aluminum shafts and he harvests every single year. Um, a benefit of an aluminum arrow is that it's typically heavy. Um, grains per inch. Arrows are measured in uh, their arrow shaft weight is grains per inch. So you're in the 10, 11, 12, 13 grains per inch, which gets you a very heavy mass weight arrow for traditional equipment is what you need. And we'll review over that a little bit later. Um, but the aluminum arrow, um, the manufacturing tolerances on it are very tight. It's a very repeatable process. And another thing I love about aluminum arrows is that the maintenance of them, whenever you're building these aluminum arrows, you can take a standard plumber's pipe wrench or pipe cutter, and you can just trim it down in the field if you're at the range and you're tuning your setups. You can cut your arrow lengths just using that simple pipe cutter. Um, also, if you're refletching, you can just take a pocket knife right to the, flet, uh, the shaft material, right to the fletchings and cut them off. And it's very hard to hurt an aluminum arrow that way. Um, 
uh, a cedar shaft and a carbon shaft, you gotta be careful how you take the fletchings off if you're gonna refletch your arrows. Um, one downside to an aluminum arrow is that they, te they tend to bend if you hit something hard or glance off of something hard or you, your, uh, an animal runs off with your arrow in them, you typically, um, that, that arrow is gone. Um, but another benefit of an aluminum arrow is that you can get a dozen aluminum arrows for half the cost of carbon arrows. So um, very cost effective, very good arrows, and it's a, for a beginner, it's a really good way to get into it for a cost effective method, so uh, cost effective way. So aluminum arrow is a really good choice, so you've got to try those out. Next type of shaft material, which is probably the most popular shaft material nowadays, is the carbon shaft. Um, for traditional equipment, they make a lot of really cool traditional geared uh, carbon arrows that have a wood grain look to them. Uh, this is a gold tip traditional. Um, carbon material is my preferred material. I converted over to carbons maybe about four years ago, five years ago, um, and I haven't looked back. Um, I'm obsessed with arrow tune, and we'll talk about tuning. Uh, we'll go through tuning steps to tuning your bow and the nice thing about the benefits of using a carbon arrow is the amount of accessories that go into carbon arrows that are available uh, on the market. So you have um, brass inserts for getting your FOC, your tip weight up. They have uh, added weight kits that you can screw into the back of the inserts um, and carbon arrows are just super strong. Um, you, it's really hard to break a carbon arrow and again, the recovery is good. Their manufacturing tolerances are tight. Um, I just like everything there is about a carbon arrow. Now, one quick thing I wanted to talk about while we're still on arrows in the fletching is the different types of fletching. You can have three fletch, four fletch. Um, this is a four fletch arrow. If you look down the arrow, you can see the four fletches. And another carbon arrow here, which is an Easton Axis. It has three fletches running down the back. Um, I like to run a four fletch. Uh, arrow for on my hunting setups and on my target setups. I use a three fletch arrow um, Another type of arrow here are competition grade arrows, uh, which are really lightweight um, maybe they're uh, thicker diameter um, for line cutters for indoor 600 rounds or IBO events um, Some target shooters like a really thin arrow aerodynamic. They won't drift in the wind um, the carbon arrow is just so versatile to whatever game you're playing. If you're playing a game, competing, or you're chasing game in the field. Um, so carbon arrows are a really good option. They, are, they do tend to be a little bit more expensive, um, but there are a lot of different options out there manufactured today if you want to try out a carbon arrow. So we're about to get into the nuts and bolts of why we created this film. How to shoot a recurve in a longbow proficiently and accurately in a short amount of time. So from a very high level, we've reviewed over the different types of bows that traditional archers tend to shoot, self bows, long bows, recurves. Also, we re reviewed over the different types of arrows that we shoot out of those bows, different ways to carry them in the quivers and different finger protection. So I'd like to review over some aiming styles and go over from a very high level some tips and tricks on uh, technique and form in this next section of the video. As I said before, this section is basically the nuts and bolts of why we put together this film. How the traditional archer shooting a recurve or a longbow gets his arrow to impact where he needs it to go. Whether he's shooting at a 150 inch whitetail in Kansas or he's shooting at a target at his local range. So I'd like to, from a very high level, review over the different aiming styles that traditional archers use to shoot their bows. The first style of aiming that I would like to review is instinctive aiming. Traditional bows, traditional archery, and instinctive aiming are paired closely together. When someone thinks about traditional bows or shooting a recurve or a longbow, they instantly think of the instinctive aimer. And the instinctive aimer basically focuses on the spot they want their arrow to hit and nothing else, and then their subconscious mind runs the shot in the background. The better you can focus on that small spot where you want your arrow to hit, the more opportunity your subconscious mind is going to have to place that arrow specifically where you want it to go. An instinctive archer's sight picture is purely focused on the spot they want their arrow to go. Everything else is blurry. Their riser, their arrow tip, their bow hand, everything around the target, everything is blurry and out of focus except for the spot they want to hit. A hyper focus on that spot. And an instinctive archer 
learns how to shoot instinctively by repetition. Hundreds of arrows shooting that same shot in their subconscious mind then programs the trajectory of that arrow and will give the archer the ability to place that arrow where it needs to go based on the angles and the trajectory and the distance to the target. So instinctive archery takes a long time to master. Um, you have to shoot a lot and there's no conscious effort to place your arrow tip or any other part of your sight picture near that target. You're just a hyper focus on that spot you want your arrow to go. Split vision is also another type of aiming method used. Split vision is a blend between an aimer and an instinctive archer. So basically when that archer draws back, his sight picture is kind of bouncing back and forth between the, air, the point on the target or the animal that they want to hit and also the arrow tip and the riser. They are aware of their arrow tip. They are aware of the bow itself and the sight picture that it's presenting, but they're not saying I am this distance from the target, I need to place my tip at this location for my arrow to arc into that target. So split vision archer is a blend between a gap shooter, and we'll review gap shooting here in a moment, and an instinctive archer. The next aiming method that I'd like to review with you is actually a hard dedicated aiming method. This is a regimented process of understanding your, the arc of your arrow. Regardless of what other, whatever aiming method you use, whether it's instinctive or split vision, I highly recommend having a very concrete knowledge of the trajectory of your arrow. I really firmly believe that'll make you a better and more accurate archer, understanding what your arrow is truly doing at different distances. Whether you want to instinctively shoot and not have to worry about how far away from the target you are, it still benefits you to go through the exercise of mapping out your arrow's trajectory and understanding what it's actually doing on its flight towards the target. In all these aiming sections, you've seen this board in back behind me showing the arrow trajectory. So I'd like to use it to demonstrate how a gap shooter uses his arrow's trajectory to help him accurately hit the target using the arrow tip as a reference. So starting on the left side here, this is where the archer is standing. This is the launch angle. And I'll reference launch angle a lot in this video or in this film later on. The launch angle of the arrow, basically most arrows follow a trajectory as shown in this blue arc here. This dotted line is line of sight. This is not the bow, That's not, this is not the arrow itself. This is the line of sight. So this is the sight of the archer to the target they wanna hit. This spot here on this purple target is where the archer wants his arrow to go. What I'm demonstrating here is what's called your point on distance. So this is the distance in which the archer will basically draw back, close his left eye or squint his left eye, and place the tip of his arrow on the target, on the spot he wants to hit. And when he releases, the launch angle of his arrow will arc up, come to its apex, and drop back down and impact right where he wants it to go. And again, this is called your point on distance. A typical traditional archer's point on distance with hunting weight limbs and hunting weight arrows is typically right around 40 yards. So that's the point at which the archer draws back, he anchors into his face, he sticks the tip of the arrow right where he wants it to go, and the arrow arcs up, and 40 yards later, it hits exactly where he wants them to go. A gap shooter's sight picture is very aware of his arrow tip. His arrow tip is almost his only focus, and the target is kind of out of focus. And it, like a split vision shooter, it'll bounce back and forth because that sight picture is so critical to him on where his arrow tip is in relationship to the target. So a point on for a gap shooter, basically that arrow tip will be covering exactly where he wants his arrow to go, at 40 yards for a typical traditional archer. They'll draw back and that point will be right on where he wants it to go. So he's paying attention to exactly where his arrow tip is in relationship to the target. So for hunting or short range shooting for a recurve and longbow, this is the gap shooter's conundrum. So what I have here is a representative target with the spot at which the archer wants to hit at the same height as their 40 yard point on. Now, what happens if the archer is standing 20, 20 yards away from the target. At 20 yards away from the target, 
the arrow is at its apex. It's at its highest point in flight on its way to the target for its point on. So at 20 yards, if the archer were to hold the same sight picture as their point on distance, so basically this dotted line holding the tip of the arrow right where he wants the arrow to impact, that arrow will arc up and it'll impact high. This is called your maximum gap. And a gap is basically in your sight picture, you stick the tip of your arrow below the target and you shoot. Aiming low on a target is the easiest way to change your launch angle. So basically this entire arc of the arrow will be condensed and brought down, pivoting along the launch angle where the shooter is and that arrow will impact here. So for an archer shooting at this distance of 20 yards, you will have to measure the spot on the target you want to hit up to where your arrows are impacting at 20 yards and that might be 20 to 30 inches on a typical traditional archer. So at 20 yards, the traditional archer gap shooting will basically stick the tip of the arrow 20 to 30 inches below the target and execute a good shot and that arrow will arc and rise into the spot he wants it to hit. And again, it's the same for five yards. It's not as high because the arrow is on his way up to the apex. And then again at 25, 30 yards, it's on its way down. So your gaps for a gap shooter are basically the distance equivalent to your standard flatline trajectory arc of your arrow you're aiming down below. So at five yards, the gap shooter would only put his tip of his arrow maybe 12 inches below the target when he executes the shot. At 15 yards, he would put it maybe 20 inches below. At his maximum gap, which would be 20 yards for a 40 yard point on, he would be placing it 25 inches below the target. And then the gaps start repeating themselves on the way down. So at 25 yards might be the same as at 15 yards. And at 35 yards might be the same as at five yards. So basically going out to the range, if you wanna try out gap shooting, you basically load your arrow on and you stand at five yards and you stick the tip of your arrow right where you want your arrow to go and your arrow will arc up and impact high. Go to the bale and take a tape measure, measure down to the spot you wanna hit from where your arrow impacted and write it on a card. So at five yards, you're at 12 inches low. That's your gap you need to set. And at 15 yards, you're 15 inches low. And at 20 yards, you're 25 inches low. And you basically work your way back from the target until you have your whole trajectory of your arrow mapped out and then now you have a reference and you can now accurately shoot using the tip of your arrow as a reference to make your arrow impact every time right where you want it to go. The next aiming method I'd like to review that is a dedicated aiming method using the tip of the arrow in reference to the target is string walking. String walking is arguably the most accurate way to shoot a recurve or a longbow. In international competition, it is by far the most popular aiming method for field rounds where you're shooting out to 50, 60 meters as well as hunting ranges um, out to 10, 20, 30 yards in those hunting ranges. String walking is very effective um, for multiple, multiple different reasons. The first reason is your sight picture is always the same. No matter what distance to the target you are, your tip of your arrow is always on the target. So your sight picture is consistent. You always place the tip of the arrow on the target like it is your point on distance. So in comparing that with gap method, that sight picture of when you take the tip of the arrow and you stick it right where you want your arrow to impact for a gap shooter that has a stagnant place on the string that they're always holding for every single shot, that is going to be 40 yards. So at 40 yards, the gap shooter will stick the tip of his arrow on the target where he wants it to go and the arrow will arc up and impact. But as we reviewed at 20 yards, the gap shooter has to start aiming low to have his arc of his arrow rise and impact where he needs it to go. And at 20 yards, that could be up to 30 inches that the archer needs to aim the tip of the arrow below the target. With string walking, they are, the string walker will change the launch angle of his arrow using the same anchor point, but by simply just coming down the string by executing a crawl. Now a crawl is basically just that, crawling down the string. So the closer you are to the knock of the arrow, this is shooting three under. The closer you are to the 
to the arrow, the further away the knock or the arrow point is from your eye. So that's how I remember it. The further away from the, the arrow is from your eye, the further the shot is. The closer the arrow is to your eye, the closer the shot. And to make the arrow closer to your eye, you need to come down the string. So I made this tab for the video showing the distances for a shot. So for example, down here is 15 yards. So at 15 yards, the string walker will basically address the string against the knock so it's consistent, put his thumb on this 15 yard mark and execute a crawl down the string and put, place the top of their tab where their thumb mark was. Okay, I'll do that again. So for a 15 yard shot, the string walker will place his thumb against the string and slide the tab down so the tab is touching there. In every shot, the string walker will anchor at the same point. So I want you to pay attention to how close the arrow is to my eye because it's a close shot, it's 15 yards. So the string walker will anchor and that string and that arrow is right under my eye. And the string walker will then squint his left eye, stick the tip of the arrow right on the target and execute the shot and the arrow will go there. Now, for a 25 yard shot, the 25 yard mark is right here. The string walker will place his thumb at the 25 yard mark, crawl down the string, and now he will execute the shot. But notice, the arrow is now a little bit further away from my eye compared to my 15 yard shot. So a little bit further away, the distance is a little bit further away. And so what the string walking archer is actually doing is he's changing the relationship, that launch angle of that arrow, but he's still anchoring in the same spot every single time. But that arrow now is either up here or all the way down here. And he's adjusting the pitch of the arrow as it's clearing the bow and changing the trajectory. So bear with me here for a moment. So for a 25 or a 20 yard shot, which would be right here where the top of the apex of in our 40 yard point on distance example, the string walker will make his crawl and execute the shot and basically change his arrow's trajectory to look something like this. And so he's changing the pitch of the arrow and where the arrow crosses this line of sight is the distance at which he's shooting. So a string walker has the benefit of having the same sight picture no matter the distance to the target by just executing a crawl, closing his left eye, sticking the tip of the arrow right where he wants it to go and executing a good shot. Now to find that, it's very simple. And these aiming methods that I'm showing you work for every type of bow that I reviewed other than the self bow. I would be a little hesitant to crawl down the string and take, because what you're doing is you're preloading your bottom limb a little bit more than your top limb. So any laminated long bow or recurve, you can string walk on it. I string walk on one piece long bows. I string walk on one piece recurves and take down recurves. And how you go about doing that is you just basically take your tab or your glove, you address the string three under, and just start mapping it out. Come down the string, you know, an inch, anchor, stick the tip of your arrow right where you need it to go, and maybe you're standing at 20 yards and shoot the shot. At 20 yards, if you impact high, then all you need to do is come down the string maybe an inch and an eighth and reshoot the shot. Once you find that distance at 20 yards, as far down the, the string that you need to go, that crawl distance, then just make a mark on your tab or mentally note it that you're one and a half fingers down the string for 20 yards. But string walking typically works really well with a tab because tabs have stitches against where you're applying your tab against the string. So you can count stitches. So maybe a 20 yard crawl is five or six stitches down your tab. So in competition, you're not allowed to make marks and actually write your distances on these tabs. You have to just use a tab and by memory know that a 40 yard shot is three stitches down and a 15 yard shot might be 20 stitches down. And you just apply that to memory and you can go out and know that you're 25 yards away from the target come down to your 25 yard crawl and execute the shot, stick the tip of the arrow right where you want your arrow to go and your arrow will impact there. The next aiming method is what I'm really gonna go into detail about 
in the following sections, and that's called the fix crawl. The fix crawl is just, I believe in it so much, it is medicine for the hunting traditional archer. Basically, it's blending gap shooting and string walking into one package that is lethal in the woods for standard hunting ranges from 30 yards and in. What if we could blend string walking and gap shooting? The problem with string walking for hunting is you may be sitting in your stand and you'll have a game animal approaching you. He might be standing at 20 yards and just when you're getting ready to make your crawl and shoot your shot, he takes another five, five steps closer. So now you have to reset and make that crawl to 15 yards and then he keeps coming. So string walking may work if you're hunting over a food source where an animal will stay stationary for a while and grazing. But if you're hunting travel routes and travel corridors like I'd like to, string walking is not ideal because that animal is typically always on the move. So I don't like to string walk in the woods. And then also at low light, it's really hard for you to see your tab or your fingers and really execute a really accurate crawl down that string to that distance that that animal is standing. Gap shooting, gap shooting for hunting, as we discussed, typical hunting weight bows and hunting weight arrows, you have a a point on distance of 40 yards. And with a 40 yard point on, your gaps are huge. So at 20 yards, if you have an animal standing there and you have a 30 inch gap that you need to aim low so your arrow will impact him in the vitals, you're pretty much aiming at the ground in front of that animal. You're aiming at his feet. And it's really hard to accurately understand that at eight yards, you might only be 12 inches below the vitals but at 20 yards, you need to hold 30 inches. It's really hard. Those big gaps are really hard to apply in the woods. So what a fixed crawl is, is taking the best of string walking and the best of gap shooting and blending it into one powerful aiming method. So basically what we're doing is we're, you can make your point on distance anything just by crawling down the string. For hunting, I like to run a 25 yard fixed crawl. And here is what a 25 yard fixed crawl looks like. The same arrow setup as our previous example of the arcing arrow of the gap shooting with a 40 yard point on. But what I've done is I've crawled down the string to my 25 yard crawl and I put a brass knock on the string right where that crawl is. And so now every time I address the string, I come up to that brass knock every time. So now I don't have to look in the woods with a game approaching, I don't have to make a crawl. I just slide my tab up to that brass knock and I execute the shot. Here's the benefit of the fixed crawl. I know at 25 yards, when I slide my tab up against that brass knock on the string below my arrow, that at 25 yards, I just have to draw back and stick the tip of the arrow at 25 yards on that animal and that arrow will arc and hit point on right in the vitals. Here's the benefit. By changing your point on and bringing it in from 40 yards by crawling down the string, and by crawling down the string, you're changing your launch angle of your arrow coming out of your bow, you've also drastically reduced your gaps. So now at five yards, 10 yards, 15 yards, 20 yards, your gaps are very manageable. They're about eight inches. And so now with a fixed crawl, no matter what distance that animal is in or at from you, you're basically sticking the tip of the arrow somewhere on that animal, whether you're putting it right at the bottom of the chest or you're covering up the vitals for your point on of 25 yards. I've harvested a lot of animals shooting instinctively and aiming instinctively. I did it for years and there's nothing wrong with it. And one of the best hunters that I know, his trophy room is something that any hunter, no matter what equipment choice, would be proud of. He is just one of the best hunters I know, and he actually made those self bows, and he's from our local club. I believe he shoots instinctive shooting as well. Every year around the country, there are instinctive archers out there harvesting game year after year. But the downfall to instinctive archery is that it takes repetition, and it's a big barrier for compound archers to want to leave their modern technology at home and bring a recurve knowing that it's gonna take two to five years to get very accurate. It's a big jump backwards to shooting instinctive archery from coming from more modern equipment like a compound. For me, I shot instinctive archery for about three, four years at the very beginning of my archery career. 
and I harvested a lot of animals, like I said. But I noticed something. I converted to gap shooting for about a year, and I didn't like it for the woods for the reasons we explained, the very large gaps. I was missing deer high because I was setting my gaps incorrectly based off the distance the the animal was from me. And I went back to instinctive shooting. I noticed something, that I became a much better instinctive archer after I learned the trajectory of my arrow, after my stent in gap shooting. And what I think happened was, I think I trained my subconscious mind to be aware of the tip of the arrow in relationship to the target. And that made me a better instinctive archer. And so I was instinctive archery for another maybe two years after my stent in gap. And then a local guy at one of our target clubs, he took me under his wing and brought me into the competitive side of archery. And the competitive side of archery is something, it's a whole new world, a part of traditional archery that I didn't even know existed. Going to IBO shoots, shooting indoor 600 feet of rounds, it was just, it unlocked this side of archery that I didn't even know existed. And how accurate these archers are that are competing around the country every single year at these IBO events, they're some of the best non-sighted recurve and longbow shooters in the world shooting at these events. And all of them are aimers. All of them are using the tip of their arrow in reference to the target to shoot accurately. In IBO, they're always shooting these competitions during the off season. And you ask yourself, well, the off season, off season from what? From hunting season. The IBO competition year ends in August and starts up again in January. It takes all hunting season off. And I hear so often when I talk about aiming or using the tip of the arrow, or if you're researching online, a lot of instinctive archers are very proud of the way and the challenge of which they shoot their bow. And you always hear, I'm a hunter, not a target archer. Well, I'm a hunter too. And some of the best archers of non-sighted recurves and longbows compete every single year in these IBO events. And they are deadly accurate. And they are consistently harvesting game over 30 yards with their recurves and their longbows simply by using the tip of their arrow in reference to the target. I don't have anything against instinctive archery. I don't have anything against split vision archery. I don't have anything against anyone shooting any type of hunting equipment. We're all sportsmen. We all want to be more ethical. We all want to be more accurate. In this film, we've titled The Push because we want to push those compound archers or those instinctive archers that have been struggling with accuracy for three or four years and just frustrated and maybe pick up their compound by the time hunting season comes around. We want to push you to try something. Get out of your comfort zone, crawl down the string, use the tip of your arrow to aim, and become a more proficient archer. I think it's very easy to do. In some archery circles, aiming and using the tip of their arrow is sacrilege. But I disagree with that. It's right in front of you. It's right under your nose. So why wouldn't you use it? It has tons of benefits. It's kind of like the guy that first started curving the ball during bowling. You know, bowling for decades, whenever the first sport was invented, everyone was straight down the lane and, you know, make, maybe knocking over eight pins. But then that first guy decided he's going to start spinning that ball. I'm sure a lot of the people were saying he's cheating. But if you looked at his equipment and compared it to the other bowlers, it's the same equipment. And that's the same with archery. If I look at my equipment compared to somebody aiming a different way from me, and they feel that I'm cheating because I'm using the tip of the arrow, it's right in front of you. When you compare the equipment, it's a bow that has limbs and a single string and no sights. Why wouldn't you use the tip of your arrow? It's the point of your entire setup that your brain has to use the least amount of math to get that arrow to impact the target where it needs to go. So let's head on over to the range. I'll show you exactly how to set up a fixed crawl setup and give it a try. I think you'll enjoy it. Before we dive into the step-by-step -step setup of a fixed crawl, I'm gonna shoot two shots for you. I wanna demonstrate gap and I wanna demonstrate string walking. And so it's gonna be two shots from 20 yards. I'm gonna shoot the gap shot like it was my point on. I'm gonna draw back, I'm gonna stick the tip of my arrow right on the target, and I'm gonna impact high. Because my point on, my true point on, to where my arrow leaves my bow and impacts where my arrow tip is, is 40 yards. The second shot is gonna be string walk. I'm gonna string walk down to a 20 yard crawl, execute the shot, 
and hopefully my arrow just arcs right into where it's supposed to go. So this shot is the gap shot. I'm gonna just put my tab right up against the arrow, anchor where I normally do, put the tip right where it needs to go. So I impact it high since I'm at 20 yards. Next, I'm gonna make my 20 yard crawl down to 20 yards. Same sight picture as the previous shot. Okay, let's go take a look. So the first shot with a 40 yard point on gap shooting at 20 yards if I drew back and stuck the tip right where I wanted it to go it's impacting this high so I would basically have to aim this low to hit this target so I'd be aiming down here in the ground for my arrow to arc up now for hunting that's not ideal but it's nice that I'm addressing the string at the same spot every single time and so my arrow tune with my broadhead is consistent shot to shot. That is a benefit of addressing the string in the same spot every time. Now this shot, it's a little left, but this shot here, I drew back from my 20 yard crawl, stuck the tip of my arrow right where I wanted it to go and executed the shot. And my arrow arced in, so I'm changing the launch angle of my arrow depending on the distance that I'm at. The problem with that for hunting is like we addressed. If you're on a travel route or a travel corridor, you don't want to have time, you don't have time to go 25 yards and making these multiple crawls down the string depending on where the deer is. And then in addition to that, when you tune your arrows with your broadhead, now your arrows are out of tune for any crawl distance that you're outside of where you tuned your arrow. So let's say you tuned your arrow at a 25 yard crawl and you bear shafted and you tuned and you got your arrow shooting very nicely. Well, the minute you come down to your 15 yard crawl, now your arrow is slightly out of tune compared to where you tuned it from. So that's another downside to string walking for hunting. Now, let's blend these together. Let's set up this bow with a 25 yard fixed crawl. So at 25 yards, I can draw back and stick the tip of my arrow right on the target. And anything under that, I'm still going to shoot it down the string from my 25 yard crawl, but I'm gonna gap shoot. I'm gonna aim low. And we'll map out, out to 25 yards, what that looks like. So setting up a fixed crawl is really easy. I've identified 10 steps to do so. The first step is to apply a second brass knock point or a tie-on knock point underneath your knock indicator, okay? When you're down the string a little ways, when you release that arrow, there's a lot of downward force on your string, on your arrow, coming from your string. So if your knocks aren't secured on both the top and bottom, your arrow might slide up and down that serving as it's coming to brace and before the arrow detaches from the string. So step one is you're gonna wanna add a second knock point here. Step two is basically loading an arrow, getting ready to shoot. And step three is coming down the string a certain distance. Just come on down the string. As you can see, I switched out my tab to my hunting tab. And you can come on down the string, you know, maybe an inch, okay? And what you're gonna do is just stand at the distance at which you want your point on to be. So right now we're standing at 25 yards. And I'm just gonna come down by an inch and try to remember where you came down to. Come down the string an inch and anchor just like you normally anchor. Come on back, get comfortable in there and execute a shot and stick the tip of your arrow where you want it to go and see where you impact. If you impact slightly high, then you're gonna wanna come down the string just a touch more. If you impact low, you're gonna wanna come up the string just a touch more, okay? So just basically follow where you want your arrow to go. If your arrow hits high and you want it to come down, come down the string a little bit. If your arrow hits low and you want it to come up, come up the string a little bit. And then just iterate that process until you find the spot down the string that you can wink the left eye, stick the tip of the arrow on it, and your arrow will arc in there. And then from there, we'll move into step four, which is adding a brass knock. 
So I'm gonna go ahead and find my 25 yard crawl, stick the brass knock indicator onto the string, and then we'll go ahead and map out the arrow trajectory from 25 yards in it. So as you can see, I've found my 25 yard point on, okay, my crawl here, I've applied a brass knocking point. Now from here on out, I'm always going to just slide my tab up or my fingers if I'm shooting a glove right onto that brass knock and I'm going to shoot every shot the same. I'm going to come back and anchor and I'm just going to put the tip of my arrow where it needs to be for it to impact whatever distance we're at. So that's the next step that we need to go and find. We're going to start at five yards. 5, 10, 15, 20, because we know our 25 yards is point on. So what I'm basically going to do is stand at 5 yards, draw back, anchor, stick the tip of my arrow at the center of the target, and I'm going to shoot. And I'll impact high, just like gap shooting. I'm going to impact high. I'm going to do that at 10 yards and at 15 yards and at 20 yards. And I want to map that arrow's trajectory now that I'm shooting from a 25 yard point on. And we know at 25 yards, if I draw back and stick the tip of my arrow on the target, it's gonna impact there. And then I'm gonna go back to 30 yards. All right, so I'm here at five yards. I'm gonna go ahead and slide my tab right up against that 25 yard fixed crawl. And I'm gonna just aim at the center of that cardboard and I'll impact high. yards you can see it's impacting very similar to the five yard we've got a pretty flat trajectory here up to 10 yards here we are at 15 do the same thing draw back stick the tip of the arrow right in the center of the target and see how high we impact tight group, which is good. You know, I'll explain why that's really good. Okay, now here we are at 20 yards. Okay, let's go take a look. So all I did here was, again, at 5, 10, 15, and 20, I drew back, I stuck the tip of my arrow right here in the center of this target, and I impacted high. So this group is so close, I didn't need to keep track of which arrow was 5 yards, which arrow was 10 yards, which typically you would have to gap shooting because you have such a bulbous trajectory. But when you take this bulbous trajectory and you pitch it downward, you tend to have a pretty flat trajectory at the beginning because you're almost, as that arrow is climbing, it's pretty flat as it's climbing. It's climbing pretty steady. But when you pitch the angle of the arrow by coming down the string and string walking, you're taking that flat incline of your arrow trajectory at the beginning after it clears your bow and you're pitching it downward. And now you have a benefit of a pretty flat trajectory. So basically what this is, is basically six inches, six to eight inches, for 5, 10, 15, and 20, I just have to nestle my tip 5 to 6 inches down below the target and my arrow will rise right into the center of the target. So let's do one more. Let's take this target and set it up top and step back to 30 yards. I'll draw back, stick the tip of my arrow in the center of the target and see how low I impact. I just like to know past my point on exactly what my arrow is doing as it's passing my point on distance. So here we are at 30. Um, all I'm going to do is stick the tip of the arrow right where I want it to hit and I'm going to drop in low and let's map that as well. Okay, 
Let's go check it out. So here's my 30 yard shot. Little touch right form issue, but you know, again, probably about a solid eight or nine inches low. So for a 30 yard shot, I know I just need to address the string at my 25 yard crawl, anchor like I normally do, draw back, stick the tip of the arrow on top of the target by eight or nine. So I'd basically, to hit the center at 30 yards, I'd stick the tip of my arrow at the top of the cardboard here. That's called stacking. So if you're purposely sticking the tip of the arrow below the target to get it to rise into the spot you want to hit, it's called gap. And then you start stacking arrows on top. So stacking is aiming above the target past your point on distance and having that arrow drop into where you want it to go. So now that we've seen this in all the different gaps in tra arrow trajectories, let's go to the board, let's map it real quick, and then let's head over to some 3D targets and put it into practice. Okay, so remember the arrow trajectory, this red arc being our gap shooting point on. So out here at the target, we have 40 yards with this center point being 20 yards. Okay, so you remember my gap shot, how high I hit. So my gap basically is exact opposite of the arrow's trajectory. Okay, so I impacted high here at 20 yards when I was gap shooting and roughly let's say that was 25 inches. So basically here I'd have to stick the tip of the arrow 25 inches below the target for it to hit up. String walking, I just come down to my 25 yard crawl, I stick the tip of the arrow right where I want it to go, and it impacts there. Fixed crawl, blending the two, we found at 25 yards, okay? So we set up a 25 yard crawl at 25 yards. So at 25 yards, I just stick the tip of the arrow where I want it to go. And we saw at five yards, my gap, which is now following exact opposite of this blue line, okay, my gap here was about six inches. And at 10 yards, my gap here was roughly about eight inches. And at 15 yards, my gap was again eight inches, a really close group, really flat trajectory here. And at 20 yards, it was probably closer to six inches again. So basically, six inches, eight, eight, and six from five, 10, 15, and 20. Now remember, my stacking with my gap following this blue line, now my stacking comes up like this because it's following this trajectory coming down. So now I have to stack on top of it. And we saw that that was a solid at 30 yards I had to stack on top of it a very generous 10 inches. Okay, nine or 10 inches. So let's head to the 3D targets and let me show you just the geometry of an animal and why this fixed crawl shooting method is really beneficial. So we're here at the 3D targets. I'm just gonna shoot a couple shots, three arrows. I'm gonna shoot at the hog at roughly about 15 yards, the turkey at 18 to 20, and then a white ram that's right at my point on of 25 yards. Shoot three arrows, let's head on down. We'll talk about why a fixed crawl is just pure medicine for hunting when you're in the woods. The added benefit of having condensed gaps with a fixed crawl is that a rangefinder like this is almost useless any distance prior to your point on distance. So at 5, 10, 15, and 20, I don't look at that animal and say, is that 5 yards? Is that 10 yards? Is that 15 yards? Which is a big um, detractant to people wanting to try to aim and use the tip of their arrow. They don't want to have to worry about how far the animal is from them. That's why instinctive archery is so appealing to shooting a recurve and longbow, is that you don't have to think about it. 
you don't have to own a rangefinder. You just look at the target and you execute the shot. The nice thing about the fixed crawl is I don't think about that. I just basically have these targets or these animals. My ranges are either short, point on, or far. If it's short, I'm basically nestling my tip right here at the bottom of the animal because six to eight inches puts me right in the vitals. And at 25 yards, I'm putting the tip of the arrow right on the target like you saw on that ram shot. And at 30 yards, I know that I'm 10 inches high. So I basically put top of back. So five to 20 yards, I'm nestling the tip of my arrow right at the bottom of the chest. 25 yards, I'm somewhere in the vitals. And at 30 yards, I'm holding top of chest or top of back, which is deadly medicine for the woods, for hunting ranges for whitetail. Now, another benefit of a fixed crawl is that it's movable. So let's say you're going out west, you're gonna be hunting an elk, and the elk's vitals is the whole height of this entire deer target. So now, just move your fixed crawl up towards the arrow a little bit and go and find a 35 or a 40 yard, or just gap shoot, because basically, holding at the bottom of the chest and having a 12, 13, 14 inch gap is manageable on a long shot like an elk or a moose with a big vital. But for hunting whitetails or, or turkeys, it's really nice to be able to simply picture eight inches, which is coincidentally my pinky to my thumb, eight inches low is where I'm putting my arrow, right at the bottom of the chest. So I just want to shoot a few shots with a one-piece longbow just to show you that the fixed crawl method is transferable to any type of bow. It doesn't have to be a high-tech riser and ILF limbs like I was just shooting. I know I look quite ridiculous right now, but the application of these stickers to demonstrate my anchor point was the only way I could think to do it without being there with you. So I believe that the anchor point, a very consistent anchor, is critical to implement a fixed crawl. Any variation of your head position in relationship to the arrow tip is like a difference of three or four yards. But a very solid, repeatable anchor is very simple to implement. I'll show you what I do and I, I highly recommend it. Even if you're an instinctive shooter, having a consistent anchor is a big benefit. So the stickers on my hand represent where they're going to go on my face. So the green sticker at the base of my thumb and the red sticker at the base of my index finger, they meet up with the colored stickers on my face. So the base of my thumb knuckle nestles in to this green sticker at the back of my jaw, real solid anchor. And the red sticker nestles in right here at this jawbone, kind of like I'm laying on a gun rest. And those two anchors against my face are very repeatable and very hard contact surfaces. And you'll notice I have a yellow sticker here on my nose. That mat mates up with a landmark on my string or my arrow somewhere. I like to set up my 25 yard fixed crawl and use my nose against the knock of the arrow. And so that gives me a running a three point anchor. And I'll show you a demonstration with a three-legged stool of why I believe that this three-point anchor system is the way to go. But basically, I'll just draw back, and I have my hand in a C position. And that green sticker and that red sticker just come back naturally and nestle right into the face. And once I'm back to anchor and I get into my back tension, I just find the knock of the arrow with the tip of my nose. And that gives me a very repeatable three-point anchor. So I'll demonstrate it here. Draw back, back of the jaw, rest my head against my index finger knuckle, and then my nose comes in and touches. That's a three-point anchor. I'm gonna use this standard tripod hunting stool to demonstrate why I tend to use a three-point anchor, and just from physics, why it makes sense to me. So basically, in traditional archery, we always talk about an anchor point. Well, a point is a specific spot, right? A one contact point. And so a lot of guys use their index finger or the middle finger in the corner of their mouth and they call it good. So again, we were showing how even instinctive shooting, you're 
eye in relationship to your sight picture is important. A repeatable head position, shot to shot, is a very important thing. And I want to show the degrees of freedom that this stool, or your head, representing your, stu your stool represents your head, how many degrees of freedom that you have with running a single point, a two point, and a three point anchor. So a single anchor point, finger in the corner of your mouth, your head has all these degrees of freedom swiveling around that single point. So this stool is not restricted other than that single anchor point or that single point that this single leg touches the ground. Now if you implement a two-point anchor system, it gets a little bit better. So you implement a two-point anchor system. Now you have an anchor line, if you will. But you still have degrees of freedom here. You still pivot along that line. And an anchor plane, which is three points makes a plane, is extremely stable and repeatable. So bringing that knuckle, holding your hand as a C, and reaching that knuckle back to behind your jawbone, resting your base of your index finger against your cheekbone like you're laying on a stock of a rifle, and then finding a landmark on the string, whether it's the knock at the top of your nose or the knock right against your nose or maybe the knock slightly below it. As long as that's that landmark that you find on your string is good, you now have an anchor plane and it's very consistent and repeatable shot to shot. I'd mentioned before that throughout my journey in traditional archery, I had two significant increases in accuracy. The first one was learning how to properly tune a bow and your arrow recipe. And then the second was the implementation of a fixed crawl or becoming an aimer using the tip of my arrow. I wanna just quickly review bear shaft tuning. There's three types of tuning that are common in traditional archery. One is just shooting flat shafts. And if they're flying good, then they're good and that's pretty common. But the fletchings on the back end of the arrow really mask what's really going on with your arrows that are in flight. The second way is paper tuning. Paper tuning is used to tune compounds a lot. And then the third is bear shaft tuning. Uh, bear shaft tuning and paper tuning are both very good options and ways to tune your bow. But I prefer bear shaft tuning. And you'll always see in my quiver, I always hold a bear shaft in my in my quiver just for it's basically my form trainer as I'm shooting every session I'm shooting I'll usually throw the bear shaft on the string and take a shot I know it's perfectly tuned to my bow and so that bear shaft should fly true and group with my flat shafts and if it doesn't I know I'm doing something wrong in my form so what I'm going to do is just demonstrate real quickly there is so much information about bear shaft tuning on the internet so there's no there's no real gap there but I want to include it in the video so this can stay as a one-stop shop for everything you need to know but we're just gonna real quickly I'm gonna shoot two fletched arrows and then two bear shafts one's going to show really stiff and one's gonna show really weak we'll go down to the target and then we'll just talk about it real quick how to correct your bear shaft and some pitfalls with bear shaft tuning Let's go check them out. So when you have an arrow set up, whatever you're shooting right now, shoot your fletch group and then shave some feathers off your arrows if you haven't bear shafted yet. Or if you have a new set of arrows, just leave one of them unfletched. I like to just shoot a bear shaft when I buy a new dozen arrows if it's different than an arrow recipe that I've tried before. And then I'll just shoot the first bear shaft. And if I'm drastically off left or right, then I don't even worry about it. I'll just go to a different spine range. The spine of an arrow is really important. There's static spine and dynamic spine. The spine of an arrow is measured 26 inches apart and you hang a two pound weight in the middle. The deflection of that arrow tells you the static spine of the arrow. So a 500 spine shaft 
deflects a half inch, 0.5 inches. A 400 spine shaft, when you hang that weight, will bend and deflect 0.4 inches. So basically a stiffer shaft. And the same for a 340 and same for a 300. 300 it only deflects 0.3 inches. So here's our group of our flat shafts. I drew back and I aimed right at my grouped flat shafts. Here's a shaft with the feathers taken off. And if you impact to the left of the flat shafts, that means that this is too dynamically stiff. And if you impact to the right of your fletch group, that means you're too dynamically weak. And when, when, I, when I keep saying dynamic, if you have a pole and you hang a brick on the end of the pole and you shake that pole a little bit, that pole will deflect a little bit and it'll be a little rubbery. Now take that same pole and hang a cinder block on the end of it and shake it. It's going to dynamically react differently. It's still the same pole, but the different weight at the ends will make it spongier or more dynamically weak. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take these flat shafts and leave them here. And these bare shafts I'm going to pull out and I'm going to add some tip weight. I'll mess with these arrows and go ahead and shoot it again. And I should be able to get one of these arrows to fly true and match up with my flat shafts. And then that's what you're really looking for. Go take a look. Okay, so I took my weak shaft and I adjusted the tip weight and I brought this bare shaft into grouping with the fletch shafts that we left here earlier. So I shot that from about 15 yards and from 10 to 15 yards when you're tuning your setup, if you can get your bare shafts to, to group with your fletch shafts, I call that a coarse tune. As you start stepping back, while I might have corrected the shaft from hitting weak, and bringing it over enough by adjusting the tip weight, reducing the tip weight, I might have gone too far. So when you step back to 20 and 25 yards, this bare shaft might have continued to travel in the left motion and impacting here. I might have went too far. So a 20 to 25 yard bare shaft and group that looks like this, I'd call a medium tune. And then a micro tune is anything 30 yards and over. Whenever I'm tuning my hunting setup, or my competition rigs, I really strive for a micro tune. And with the ILF risers, with the adjustable tiller, man, you and the adjustable weight, you can really dial it in. So there's a lot of things you can do to adjust your bear shaft. And there's droves of information out on the internet on how to do that. If you have a weak shaft, you can shorten the shaft and make it dynamically stiffer. You can reduce the tip weight. You can do things on your bow. Reduce the weight with an ILF bow. You can reduce the weight and bring that in as well. If you have a stiff shaft, you can increase the tip weight. You can go down to the next spine range, static spine range. So basically, if you're stiff at 400, you can go to a 500 shaft um, and also a longer arrow, but it's hard to add arrow length to an arrow you've already cut. Also, real quickly, if you're hitting low or hitting high, you can adjust your knock point and get your bear shaft to group with your flat shafts. But again, there's tons of information on the internet on how to micro tune a setup and how to bear shaft tune, so I won't go into too, many, too much more detail. I want to talk briefly about the importance of a perfectly tuned arrow for a recurve and a longbow. We're not shooting 300 feet per second like a compound or any other modern equipment, so we're in the 160 to 200 feet per second range for a hunting setup, even maybe as slow as 140 feet per second if we have a really heavy arrow. But I want to talk about as soon as that arrow leaves that string, we move into conservation of energy. And what I mean by that is a perfectly balanced arrow in the middle has zero FOC, front of center, weight. It's critical that we tune our bows to where we're conserving as much energy downrange. And the importance of FOC front of center is that you're adding the weight that your balance point of your shaft is somewhere in front of the center of the arrow and the further forward you can get that the better and here's why your feathers are doing work your feathers are correcting that arrow as it's paradoxing or trying to correct itself on the weight of the target so if you can think of that wind resistance coming across and your balance point is here and you have a 30 inch arrow your feathers are working with 15 inches of a lever arm and it's kind of back and forth working itself until it finally corrects itself and it's flying true to the target. So think about taking a lug nut off of your tire with a 15 inch wrench. 
Now, if you tune your arrows, if you go to a stiffer spine, so you can add more tip weight to get it to bear shaft properly, you're just increasing your FOC, your front of center. So it's very critical to try to get as much FOC as you possibly can. And the reason why is if your balance point is where my finger is now on a 30 inch arrow, now you're working with a 20, maybe a 22 inch lever arm. So now take that lug nut and add eight to nine inches to the end of that wrench. Now it's a whole lot easier. You just added leverage. So now your feathers don't have to do as much work. It's really easy for them to correct themselves. So here you're kind of working really hard to correct itself. It's, it's burning up energy downrange. Here, now it's, it's real easy for it. You're not burning up as much energy. And then also when you bear shaft tune, if you have a perfectly bear shaft arrow and it's flying straight to the target with no wobble in the air, now you don't have to worry about wet feathers. So I know that's a big concern with traditional equipment and turkey feathers, is that when it does rain, your arrows suck down to the shaft. But if you have a perfectly tuned arrow, those feathers don't have to do as much work and they're not as critical to correct that arrow on flight. So there's just a lot of benefits to a perfectly tuned arrow and also the conservation of energy theory of an arrow setup downrange. In this miscellaneous section of our film, I just wanted to briefly review over my choice of hunting equipment and my hunting recurves. Um, traditional archers by nature are gear junkies, so I always like to hear people talk about whether I'm watching internet reviews or I'm at a local range. I like to hear people talk about their equipment and why they prefer that type of equipment and what they use in the woods and their experiences. And you learn a lot from talking to people about their trials and tribulations about arrow weights and arrow tunes and what's working well for them, what's not working well for them. So I just want to take a couple minutes and from a very high level explain the bow that I'm currently shooting for hunting and then also some of the characteristics of why I like to hunt with that bow or that type of bow. This is my hunting bow and throughout the film you saw me shooting this riser with a set of ILF, um, the limb attachment system, the ILF longbow limbs. Uh, I hunt with recurve limbs um, the typical draw weight of one of my hunting bows is right in the 50 pound range. Um, it's, it's plenty of weight for a white-tailed deer and that's primarily what, what we hunt here in western Pennsylvania. The first thing you'll notice about my hunting rig is I do run a bow quiver on all of my hunting bows. Um, I just prefer a bow quiver for hunting. Uh, side quivers, back quivers are great, you know, it's a personal preference, but I don't like to go searching for my arrows if I shoot an arrow and have a bad shot and I need to get a quick second arrow on. It's just really nice to have the arrows here. And an additional benefit of that is I like to just, I, I throw my tab around my arrow and put it in my arrow grippers here. Um, so all of my bows that have bow quivers on them have a, their own dedicated tab to them. So I can basically, if, you know, my wife gets home early and I can get a quick hour hunt in. I can just run down, grab my bow, bow off the bow rack, and I have everything I need to go and hunt. Um, so I do like running bow quivers. And from a bow quiver standpoint, um, this bow quiver has been with me for pretty much seven years, I think, is whenever I got this bow quiver. This is a Selway slide-on. I like the Selway slide-ons probably the best for hunting. Um, they are, in my opinion, one of the most bomb-proof quivers out there right now. Um, and they're doing really cool stuff. They're doing custom laser work on the hoods, really customizable um, quivers. So if you haven't checked out Selway Archery's quivers, you should give them a try. Um, on another other couple bows that I, that I do shoot, um, I run a Great Northern bow quiver. Great Northern, another great option. So again, you just gotta try them out. Whether you like a strap-on quiver, a slide-on quiver, or a bolt-in quiver for uh, riser inserts, it's just a personal preference. One thing we reviewed earlier was finger protection. I do run a tab. Um, I like the tab. I can just strap it onto or slide it over one of my arrows. It's, it stays there. While I'm in the woods hunting, it's nice to flip the tab to the back side of your hand and you have your bare fingers to work with if you need to do something in the tree stand. Um, so I do prefer a tab. My arrows, I strive for shooting the heaviest possible arrow I can accurately, and that's key. Um, I'm not going to run a 900 grain arrow if I can't shoot past 15 yards accurately. And so I go as heavy as I possibly can, and if I feel out at my further distances that I'm sacrificing accuracy, I'll start lightening that arrow to flatten out my trajectory. And I found that 
running a fixed crawl, a 25 yard fixed crawl, um, which you can see my uh, knock point here for this hunting bow, um, that a 650 to a 680 grain arrow is basically the heaviest I can go and still execute good solid shots out to 30 yards with a hunting rig. Um, I think that's very important to note is shoot the heaviest possible arrow you can accurately. Any given year walking into the woods in the fall, it's a coin flip. It's very random of what bow I'm carrying in the woods for the hunting year and what arrows I'm running. I typically, right around June, July time frame, I start thinking about putting together an arrow recipe. I don't think I've hunted with the same bow and arrow combination back to back years. I'm always changing, I'm always tweaking. Uh, I, I like to tinker, I'm a big tinker. So the arrows that are in this quiver right now are the gold tip traditionals, very good shaft. Uh, the axis traditionals, any axis, any carbon arrow, aluminum arrow, cedar arrow, it's all personal preference. As long as you can get it to tune perfectly to your rig, then it, it's, it's gonna be satisfactory for hunting within ethical hunting ranges. Now, one thing that you'll note about these arrows is the white tape, we discussed that earlier. So you'll see that on my hunting bows, all my hunting arrows will have the white band tape for aiming on the backside. Um, this is a field tip arrow. Uh, for years, I hunted with two blade broadheads. I've recently, over the last, I think, two or three years, switched over to a three blade broadhead, a cut on contact. So for traditional equipment, you are gonna wanna use a cut on contact. Um, typically, you don't wanna burn up any energy or sacrifice any momentum um, going through, penetrating through the animal. So you don't wanna use a mechanical broadhead. You wanna use a nice cut on contact uh, fixed blade broadhead. This is a VPA three blade, 250 grain broadhead. I love the VPAs, they're very easy to sharpen with a hand file and a, and a thousand grit jewel stick or a ceramic stick, very easy to sharpen. Um, I've had very good luck with these VPAs. A lot of my hunting partners are running VPAs on their arrows and we've harvested a lot of deer over the last two or three years using these broadheads. Um, you know, there's endless options out there. This is one of those contradictory information that you'll get out on the internet of, you know, guys swear by their broadheads. They have good success. They seem to, if you put on what you think is a really good shot on an animal and that animal's not laying down the blood trail that you're expecting, then all of a sudden that, that broadhead is, is no longer can be considered. And so, you know, it's a wild animal and things happen. So one person's experience out in the woods might not match another. So again, very personal. You just need to shoot a bunch of different broadheads. You need to get field experience with those broadheads to figure out what you like. And this is an example of a two blade broadhead that I used to use. This is a Magnus one, a little bit tougher to hand sharpen with a file, but there are jigs like KME broadhead sharpeners, which is a great, very good broadhead sharpening system that'll let you get these razor sharp and razor sharp is the key. You want that broadhead to be hair popping sharp. You wanna be able to lay that broadhead across your arm and drag the broadhead across your arm and, sh and pop hairs off. Um, that's one of, the, one of the harder things to get the hang of, but once you do, it's pretty easy. Three blade broadhead, in my opinion, is a little bit easier to hand sharpen. Uh, two blade broadhead, again, great broadhead, good for penetration, it has one less blade as it's going through the animal. Um, there's benefits to both. It's just a personal preference. So get out there, try a couple different broadheads and figure out which one you like. One tip here I wanna put in the miscellaneous section of this video is the implementation of the white band. This is just simply white electrical tape. And the reason why I apply white electrical tape is a trick that I learned from one of the masters of the Barebow volumes, a great four DVD set that I highly recommend for anyone wanting to look into all the different types of archery. It's a great instructional video. This white band, when we reviewed over gap shooting or string walking or fixed crawl hunting, fixed crawl shooting for hunting, uh, we're always using the tip of the arrow. So the tip of the arrow on a field tip point is different than the tip of the arrow on a broadhead. So you'll practice all year round using a field point in the summertime. In the true tip of your point, line of sight down the shaft, you'll be applying this tip all the way out here to the target in executing your shots and your crawls and your, um, your gaps. But if you look at a broadhead, a broadhead typically starts tapering right at the back of the shaft. So you're using the end of the actual carbon arrow or aluminum arrow to aim your tip off of. So implementing this white band, now all of my gaps, I'm referencing the white band. So now I can 
take the same exact arrows and remove my field tips and apply my broadheads and my gaps will all be the same because I'm applying the same distance down the arrow. I'm, the same, I'm applying the same exact point of the arrow to the target every single time between my field point arrows and my broadheads, even judos or any other type of tip. So go get some white electrical tape, apply them to your arrows, and you'll have consistent repeatable gaps and reference points on your arrow from arrow to arrow, depending on what type of tip you're using. I mentioned about my bow weight. I'm roughly in the 50 pound range. Um, personal preference on what you can handle. I like the ILF. I'm really obsessed with the ILF limb attachment systems right now. These limbs are 50 pound limbs at my draw weight. They're very inexpensive, $120. And I basically took spray paint to them. They were all black glass, very plain Jane limbs. These are uh, Trad Tech Black Max limbs from Lancaster Archery. Uh, very good limb and very suitable for the woods. You'll see that I have a stabilizer on here and I was shooting with a stabilizer for most of the film. Um, I didn't hunt with a stabilizer this past season. Uh, it was late season. I decided to put the stabilizer on and I really like how it balanced my bow. I liked how it prevented the torque as I was releasing the string. Um, I figured I'm running these more modern ILF aluminum risers that do have the threaded bushings for additional accessories to be attached to. So. Um, I'm really liking how the stabilizer uh, makes my bow react upon the shot. One thing to note, if you do want to run a stabilizer and you've gone through the process of bear shaft tuning and micro tuning your setup and you haven't had a stabilizer on, the stabilizer will change your tune because it prevents rotation of your bow and the torquing of your bow when you're releasing the string. So just if you're going to run a stabilizer, just go back and check your bear shaft and make sure you're still in tune. You'll probably have to tweak your setup, your arrow setup just a little bit just to get that bear shaft flying straight. With these modern bows, another benefit is the threaded holes for your plungers. Um, they allow you to attach elevated rests, plungers to help cushion the arrow as you're releasing. Um, I prefer when I'm hunting to shoot off the shelf. Um, I'm very hard on my bows in the woods. Um, when I harvest a deer, I've dropped my bow out of, the, out of the tree stand if I'm so excited. I'll pick a sapling out and pitch the bow out. So I'm very hard on bows. So any type of accessory that's hanging off the bow that's fragile, um, it's not for me for hunting. And so I shoot off the shelf and you'll see here that this WF-19 riser made by C&D Archery is really nice. It has a built-in hump here. So this hump is designed to to allow clearance for, if you wanted to shoot off an elevated rest, the hump is just low enough to where that flipper rest will clear, but also you can shoot off the shelf. You have the option to shoot off the shelf. So this is a very, very good option. I, I love this WF-19 riser. Um, and I'll show you a couple other bows that I've ran in the woods um, as well. This is an AccuTune. Uh, I got this from a guy on Trad Talk, uh, Gary. And this is really nice. This does not have a spring in it. This is a hard shelf or a hard side plate. But the nice thing about it is there's a set screw on the back side of this. And you can loosen this set screw and you can dial this knob and it'll move horizontally this shelf, okay, or this side plate. So basically what you're doing is you can micro tune your center shot. So when you're bare shaft tuning, if you're hitting a little stiff or you're hitting a little weak, when you go and look online at the different ways to correct a weak or a, or a stiff bare shaft, you can just move your center shot in or out and bring that bear shaft in. It's, it's really nice for micro tuning and it's bomb proof. It's a very durable, um, screws right into the plunger hole here. Um, I really like it. So this WF-19 riser, I'm really liking it. I like the no grip style. I don't run a, a grip here. Another nice thing about these machined aluminum risers, these ILF risers, is that there's an aftermarket for grips. You can get Jaeger grips. You can buy grips from Hoyt. Um, they basically slide on here and have a little screw that screw into the aluminum riser. So you can change your grip to, this is a low grip to where your wrist is down in relationship to your forearm, a medium grip, and a high wrist grip. And I prefer a low wrist grip. Over the years, I've slowly gone from a high wrist grip to a medium, and now I'm at low. I just for me personally, with, with um, my biology, I can get better bone-on-bone -bone support through my bow shoulder if I have a low wrist grip. And I like the skinny um, geometry here of this grip area. It's really repeatable for me. So I do shoot these, I call it shooting it naked. I don't put a grip on my ILF risers. Um, and that's pretty much the, the bow setup that 
most likely I'll be carrying into the woods come this fall. And I ran this exact setup this past fall and it did great. I harvested four deer with this, with this exact setup uh, minus the stabilizer. So get out there and try some different bows. Before I started running ILF metal aluminum risers um, for my hunting equipment, I was an all wood riser shooting off the shelf kind of guy. And I've owned every type of Bob Lee recurve um, that they've manufactured over the years. I, I really just, they just fit me. Um, they are a no-nonsense hunting bow. They also make very high-end bows that perform very, very well. Um, it's a very forgiving bow, and I do like the Bob Lees. This is a Bob Lee Ultimate I had built for me. Um, JJ and Rob Lee down at Bob Lee Archery in Texas, they're just great guys to deal with. I highly recommend giving them a call. Um, an hour later, JJ will still be talking about his bows and his craft. So um, super service, great customer service. Check them out. I hunted with this bow for a long time. I harvested a lot of deer with Bob Lee bows. It, they just fit me. I tried everything. I tried Black Widows. I've tried, um, I've shot a couple stalker stick bows, zipper bows, uh, Schaefer silver tips. I mean, the list goes on and on. There's so many boyers out there making great products. And again, just like in the bow section of this film, you just got to get out there and try them. Um, this Bob Lee Ultimate is my, basically my backup bow. If anything ever happened to my ILF risers um, and I had to pick up a, a wooden recurve, I'd hop right back into the woods with this Bob Lee Ultimate. It's a great bow. And you'll notice, I, the one thing I just wanted to note, the reason why I'm holding this bow, is you'll notice all my bows have a goofy um, attachment somewhere on the lower end of the riser, and I'll explain why. Two years ago when I got into competition archery, as I started researching how to shoot a bow more accurately, a lot of the competition archers, bare bow archers, they were, they had a lot of custom weights on the bottom end of the riser. And the reason why they would do that is when you don't hold the bow and you just let it sit here, they want the bow to balance as close to vertical as possible. Okay? So there's a, a ton of different bare bow weights out there on the market. You can go to Lancaster and look at bare bow weights. I went as far as actually machining at a machine shop, having um, a guy run this on a lathe and make me custom limb bolts. And the nice thing about this is I can add two of them down here to get it more vertical. And this custom limb bolt here has the 5 16 24 thread on the end for adding additional weight if I felt the need. And it basically, these are transferable. These can be used with any takedown recurve uh, that uses a flat head screw for a bolt down. So this is a really nice option. I like having the bow jump straight out from the target. I like it balancing upward. In a typical bow, when it's manufactured from a boyer, the balance point of that bow is the deepest part of the grip, and it balances completely horizontal. So if you're not gripping your bow really hard, when you go and execute the shot, the bow wants to tip back on you. So if you apply a weight to the bottom end of the riser, when you execute that shot and let it go, it won't tip back as much. It doesn't have as much backward motion upon release. And I just find that I get a much smoother shot, a more accurate shot if that bow stays vertical and jumps straight to target. Another bow I wanted to briefly mention um, is the Hoyt Buffalo. I talked about it a little bit earlier during the bow section. Um, this is a very traditional bow, um, no attachment systems other than the stabilizer hole. Uh, the, there's no threaded holes on the side of the riser. This is just <clears throat> a pure bare bones, no nonsense hunting recurve that Fred Eichler teamed up with the engineers at Hoyt and, and designed this. It's a, it's a great bow. Um, the Gritty Bowmen are very interested in traditional archery right now. Their podcasting content has a lot of traditional, and that is awesome. Two, two uh, sportsmen that are getting into the sport and they're thirsting for knowledge, and Aaron Snyder went around and shot tons of bows, just like we've been talking about in this film, just shooting every, every bow that he could get his hands on, and he's fallen into the Hoyt Buffalo. That's currently what he's running. He just harvested a turkey with, with a Hoyt Buffalo. Fred Eichler is piling up animals every single year with his Hoyt Buffalo, and it has the formula limb attachment system, so you get the full adjustability uh, that you do on an ILF uh, rig. And I just was so impressed with this bow. I, I wasn't expecting it. Um, Whenever I first shot this bow, it's just so forgiving, and it, it just it throws that arrow with a nice, solid, deep thud, um, good performance. And if I were to upgrade this bow, I'd run some uh, Woodcore Quattros, which is uh, Hoyt's newest limb design. 
um, rather than the stock buffalo limbs that come on it. Um, but the, the stock buffalo limbs are fine. They they're, give you the performance you need to take pretty much any wild game um, in North America. So, um, But you'll notice, I want to just point out that even on the Hoyt Buffalo, I do run a barebow weight. This is just a small barebow weight to give me the balance that I, that I need. Um, and, and if you haven't tried adding a little bit of weight to the bottom of your riser, and you've been shooting traditional for a long time, just throw a little weight on there, maybe throw a six inch stabilizer with a little weight on the end. I think you'll really like the reaction of the bow when you're shooting. You'll notice in this film that I rarely talked about shooting techniques and form, and a couple of reasons for that. One, I'm not a professional. I have my own form flaws. I have my own demons I'm fighting in accuracy. So I don't care if you're doing a cartwheel as you're drawing the bow, or you're squatting, or you're hunched over, or you're drawing really fast, or you're drawing really slow. Um, I just know what works for me. Um, aiming styles, uh, have their benefits like we talked about, but the actual act of drawing the bow, getting your hand placement, again, that's as individual as the archer himself. But I feel I owe it to the viewers of this, of this film to just quickly touch on a few high-level things. There's so much information out there on the internet about correct shooting form and correct alignment, which is really critical. Jimmy Blackman's videos on YouTube, check them out. Uh, if you want to watch a guy that can really shoot and have really good form, check his videos out and try to mimic everything he's doing. Also, Masters of the Barebow, it's a four volume DVD set that you can buy on the internet. It's just, it shows all the best archers in the country, uh, traditional archers in the country, from a very traditional hunting point of view. Um, watch those. Rod Jenkins and Larry Yen go into a lot of detail about putting together a robust, consistent, repeatable shot sequence, and I highly recommend getting that, getting those, vol I think it's Masters of the Bear Bowl Volume 3. So if you're going to buy one of the four, buy Volume 3. Some very high level things that will help you have a better experience with going out in your backyard and trying a fixed crawl or using the arrow tip to aim um, with your form that I just really quickly like to show you. Um, is a low bow shoulder. I like to run a low bow shoulder and what I mean by that is if you hold your hand to your chest and you point at something straight out like you're shooting a bow, you can see where your shoulder is. But if you raise that shoulder up to the horizon and bring it back down, you'll feel that shoulder drop down and now you have a low bow, sh bow shoulder. That's kind of what I strive for, that feeling. It gives me good bone on bone support. My shoulder isn't up and pushing against my, my head and my cheek. It's very solid and repeatable and I get good bone on bone support for pushing against that bow. You've probably noticed at the range you'll have a recurve or a longbow shooter next to you or you are a recurve or a longbow shooter yourself. We like to fling arrows, we like to shoot arrows. Man, you pick up a recurve, you can shoot these things all day without getting tired. Slow down. A lot of traditional archers, they, the arrow almost hasn't even hit the target yet and they're already loading another arrow. We shoot very fast. Just slow down and enjoy the shot. Think about your shot sequence, think about your form, and just slow down and enjoy every single arrow that you're shooting. If you're shooting 10 arrows in 10 seconds, slow it down. Shoot 10 arrows in 30 seconds. And just work on your form, work on your shot sequence, and execute a good shot. It's not about quantity, it's about quality. One topic you see discussed on the internet all the time, as well as instructional DVDs, is shooting with back tension. You're trying to minimize as much muscle activity as you possibly can all through your shot sequence. And you're wanting to execute the shot with the larger muscles. Smaller muscles are typically more twitchy. Larger muscles are more fluid and smooth and you want to be fluid and smooth when you're shooting. So on the left side of my shot, on my bow arm side, I have a low bow shoulder. I have minimal muscle activity going on on the left side of my shot, just bone on bone support, just pushing against that bow. On the right side of my shot sequence, from my string hand, I'm trying to minimize the amount of muscle activity in my forearm and my hand to hold that string, to hold that weight. Just enough to when I get back to anchor, I'm comfortable enough before the release goes off or the release action happens. Shooting with your back, back tension. Imagine your older brother or one of your buddies sneaking up behind you and getting you in a headlock. You're trying to elbow him in the head to get him off you. That motion, that feeling of just pinching that back muscle back here, your rhomboid, 
that's the motion you want to use. Those are the muscles you want activated when you're shooting using back tension. So that's kind of how I picture it. Whenever I feel my back get in, I almost cam over my back when I'm shooting. I don't come out and I'm not out here. My elbow isn't coming out um, at a 90 degree from my chest. It's all the way back, it's in alignment, and I almost feel my rhomboid, my shoulder blade in the back, right side of my back, camming over, almost like a draw stop. And from there, I start placing my tip where I need it to go, and continue increasing my back tension until the release happens. And a lot of times you don't hear about people talking about release. You don't really release the string. That bow is just, primed up with so much potential energy, it's ready, that string is ready to rip from your fingers. You can't move your fingers out of the way fast enough of the string. You just have to stop holding. You let all the muscles in your forearm and in your hand kind of just go limp, and that string will take care of the rest and throw that arrow to target. So those were just some very high level things just to help you go out in the backyard and give it a try. It'll help you be a little bit more consistent and help your experience with becoming an aimer go a little bit more smoothly. One thing I pay attention to when I'm working with somebody, or even if I'm just watching a shooter in general, um, before I stare at their bows and the different types of bows they're shooting, um, or I watch their aiming style, or talk to them about their aiming style, or watch their form, the one thing I always focus on when I'm watching a shooter that I haven't seen shoot before is I watch their arrow tip. And the arrow tip will tell you a lot about a person and how they shoot. Um, basically what I mean by that is upon drawing the bow, when you draw the bow all the way back to your anchor and the arrow comes right in front of the riser, I watch the arrow tip to see if they're formed basically. You can learn a lot about a shooter by focusing in on the tip when they're at full draw. If the arrow starts to creep forward before they release the arrow, they're losing back tension, they're creeping forward. And it's hard to be consistent if you're creeping forward. What I like to see on my own, so what I do is I basically have my son or my wife or a friend or a buddy take a video close up of my riser if I'm not shooting very well and I wanna see if I'm creeping forward. So I basically focus in on the tip of the arrow with the video and I can go back and review it. And if I see any creeping before release, I know I'm losing my back tension. What you wanna see is that arrow come back, approach anchor, and then slowly as you're increasing your back tension before the release happens, you wanna see that arrow creeping backwards or at a minimum, just staying stagnant and not coming back forward whatsoever. As I mentioned before, whenever I talk to some archers about aiming benefits, using the tip of the arrow, sometimes I get a response of, I'm a hunter, not a competition shooter, not a target archer, and that's fine. This sport is about having fun and if fun to you is going out there, shooting arrows, practicing your craft, and just having a blast with it. That's what this sport is about. But there's an added benefit to having a measurable practice regimen. And by, what I mean by measurable is being able to compare yourself to how accurate, accurately you're shooting today versus last week, last month, last year. So what I highly recommend is that you go and buy some type of target that you can put on your practice bale whether you shoot the first 10 arrows cold to mimic a hunting situation and you score those first 10 arrows or maybe the last 10 arrows of your practice session after you warm up. But something that's consistent that'll allow you to measure your progress as you're tweaking your setups, tweaking your hunting bows, tweaking your shot sequence or your aiming methods. It'll allow you to identify with data exactly what's working for you and what's not working for you. Another benefit of having a measurable practice regimen is that you're inducing pressure on yourself, self-induced pressure. We all know that if you have 20 guys standing around, you know they're watching you, it's a lot harder to execute that shot than if you were just in your backyard by yourself. When a 150 class whitetail walks up next to your tree stand 20 yards away, the pressure's high, the stakes are high. So not keeping score when you're on a 3D course or not keeping score in your backyard sh shooting sessions, I think you're not maximizing your practice. You're not maximizing the potential of those practice sessions. So whether it's just you're gonna say at a 3D target in your backyard, I'm gonna see how many arrows out of 10 I can get in the kill zone, or you're actually putting a scorable target face up 
in your keeping score of 10 arrows. Again, this is all about having fun and perfecting our craft of shooting a recurve and a longbow. And I believe self-induced pressure while you're shooting just will prepare you better for when the stakes are high. Whether the stakes are an elk at 40 yards or a whitetail at 20 yards, or just shooting that next shot whenever you have a couple guys staring at you. Well, I hope you've enjoyed the push. This film was a labor of love by Tim Neville, the cameraman, and myself. Um, we really felt that there was a need for a one-stop shop, high-level basics on traditional equipment, as well as diving into the specifics of how to become an aimer and the benefits of using the tip of the arrow to shoot a bow accurately. One thing I want to address before we end the film is there seems to be a divide out there in the archery community between compound archers, traditional archers, and even within the traditional community of a guy hunting with an ILF setup like myself and some guy walking around the woods with a self bow. We're all sportsmen. Whether you hunt or you don't hunt, we're out there to perfect the craft of shooting a bow and arrow. And if you are a hunter, there's always somebody more primitive than you. So don't look down on somebody else just by the choice of their hunting equipment. If it's legal equipment for the state that you're hunting, that's okay. We're all out there to be in God's creation, to watch these wild animals, and maybe bring some meat home with us in the process. Whether you're shooting a self bow, or throwing a spear, shooting a recurve or a longbow, a compound, a crossbow, a rifle, or you're just a guy that likes to fling arrows and he goes to the grocery store to feed his family. I'll share a campfire with you and we can talk about archery all night long. Thanks for watching. <clears throat> I'm Matt Zernzak, and I'm a bow hunter. <laughs> uh, <sh> <laughs> <laughs> I'm see you do it. Hi. <laughs> Jackie, you try that. I'm really close. Really close. <laughs> I like traditional archery because <laughs> you can be just as accurate and deadly at uh, at any logical range to uh, to go out and and really harvest a, a good deer several year and it's something <laughs> yeah coming from me that's pretty good huh <laughs> yeah being able to harvest a deer at any logical range. <laughs> I'm trying not to sound like I'm making, know, like, I'm trying not to sound like I'm making shit, but at the same time it comes out like I'm talking about this. Sorry. Do you want to get the film of that? Yeah, stick so. this back in there. <laughs> I'm Matt Zernzak, and I'm a bow hunter. I got into archery um, a couple years ago. No, let's start over. We're cutting that. I got into bow hunting about a decade ago, um, and I've only shot traditional equipment. And it's been a roller coaster ride, um, you know, of, I don't like that either. Um, shooting them in the summer times at our uh, Tuesday night leagues, at our boat. How you talk this? Have you done this before? Yeah, well, not like this. But whenever <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Too far in your grill. The major benefit of the ILF limb attachment system is not only the weight adjustment. Did I go over that? When did I go over that? The last clip. Did I? Because I heard it and I hadn't heard it before. Oh, okay. Yeah, because I didn't. I, did I? Okay. All right. All right. I, I'm good. I'm good. Boo, boo, 
Bat. Before you dive into the step-by-step -step setup of a fixed crawl, I'm gonna shoot two shots for you. Holy <laughs> dude, I can't put that on film. <laughs> My bow is really good. You good at shooting your bow? Mm-hmm. I can. <laughs> Blue for real. <laughs> this will be year four. Say, uh, like, this will be year. F I've been doing archery for four years. Because I'll take his question, question out. I'll take it. I'll cut him out. Oh, I've been. Yeah, just I've been, whatever I, I ask you. Like, I got you. I got you. I got you. Jeopardy. I've been shooting traditional archery for four years. Any archery for four years. Started traditional. What Long interested about. you about traditional archery? How primal it is. I got most. <laughs> hard, isn't it? It's really hard. <laughs> I don't even know how to get into that. We make the choice to limit ourselves to the equipment that the archery industry was founded on. And it's a challenge. It's a challenge to limit our distance, and to limit the speed of our equipment. I don't know what the f I'm saying that. <laughs> just, what are you doing? Mm, just, I just want to spend time with you. <laughs> Could that be any more cute? <laughs> <laughs> My teeth? Nope. Okay. It will be. You're gonna be famous. I will. You're gonna go to Target with mommy and people are gonna go, can I get that little boy's autograph? So you better practice your autograph, practice your signature. Yep, okay. So we're about to get into the nuts and bolts of why we created this film. So from a very high level, ah, f start over. Tell me about when you broke, Shit. tell me about when you broke the window. I he broke, broke oh, you the broke, window. Tell me about when you broke it. It doesn't matter if you're not even a hunter. It seems that in the archery community today, there's a lot of divide going on between compound archers and recurve archers. What's the matter? <laughs> there's a chicken in the frame. What'd you say? There's a chicken in the frame. <laughs> you should just let it go. If you wouldn't have said it, I would have just kept going. No, but it's just, it takes away from... Yeah, how serious <laughs> it was. Everyone would be like, what the? What the? <laughs> <laughs> he, my dad told him to, sh to aim high, and, and he went high and high and high, and then he shot it, and it hit, and it broke the window. How far did you get in trouble? Yes. No, you didn't. No, he did not. <laughs> okay. Someone's shooting. Who the f shooting? <laughs> right. Trying to give you sound bits. These are good. <laughs> okay. Whether you're shooting at a 150 inch whitetail in Kansas or you're shooting at your local range at a target, all traditional archers aim. Um, there's a multiple. Damn it. <gasps> f I'm just ad living. Who's a better shot between the two of you? Who's better? You are? I did from 25 yards. Yep. As I said before, this section is the nuts. Are you going to get after some squirrels or some rabbits this year? Maybe. A lot of traditional archers use the instinctive aiming method, and I think shooting a recurve... <laughs> Shut the f*** up! <laughs> <laughs> did you ever shoot at any animal with your bow? Nope. Yeah. What was it? I think I tried to shoot a deer. I tried to shoot a squirrel. Oh. Their bow hand, their arrow tip, nothing is being attended to by their conscious mind. They're other than, oh, damn it, that was so good. So good. I like that story. <laughs> Tell the deer story. Okay. <laughs> 
So I'd like to, from a very high level, review over the different aiming styles that traditional archers use to shoot their bows. That's it. This one is backed with bamboo. Very beautiful, very lightweight. And I believe this is you, but I'm not too sure. I don't even know why I said that. We'll cut that out. So basically, um, <clears throat> man, some water. The next bow I'd like to, I don't know why I keep saying that. <coughs> now I'd like to. Here I have a. <laughs> no Institute, Imperial No Plow. Great sponsor, Selway Archery, another great sponsor. C&D Archery, WF19, great sponsor. They paid us a lot of money for this film, so the checks haven't cashed yet, so. Um, <laughs> they haven't even showed up yet. They haven't even showed up yet. <laughs> what the heck? Jeez. The second shot, I'm gonna crawl down the string to my 20 yard crawl. And execute the shot, same sight picture as before. Just gonna shoot two arrows. Go ahead. One struggle a new traditional archer or a new person looking for a recurve or longbow. We're gonna have to cut that out. Start over. Get primal. No, look straight in the camera. Say get primal. Get primal. <laughs>